Hello, everyone. Hi. Nice to Whoa. meet everyone. <laughs> well, uh, if at any point anyone wants to jump in uh, to a general question, sometimes I'll direct specific questions to, to uh, either directors or, or people in the film, but feel free whenever anyone wants to speak. Let's start off, though, with Dylan Chris. Uh, incredible movie. I was wondering how uh, the two of you first got involved in the telling of the story. Karen, you want to take that one? Yeah. Um, hi, everyone. Thanks for having us. Um, Y'all might laugh at four of our Southern accents. <laughs> during this. Um, so the Din and I both went to the University of Virginia. And so the catalyst for this film was what happened in Charlottesville in August of 2017. Um, and at that point, for about nine years, I had been volunteering in Clarkston. And I thought that that community was a great example of the opposite of the hate on display in Charlottesville. So it all started as wanting to tell, oh, look, we got Haval. <laughs> nice. Um, so it really started with, you know, meeting Haval. And we had no idea that Chris or Melissa or Arna would be part of the story. Um, and it's just one of the cool things that happens or can happen sometimes with documentary is when real life is better than something you could write. I noticed that uh, Katie Garrick is a producer. How did she get involved with this, with this film? I know that's been a wild um, un also unexpected um, aspect about this film. Um, Katie and my dad are actually friends also from UVA. You'll learn that UVA is actually just the nexus of this <laughs> documentary. Um, but Katie, I don't know if any of you have seen her series, America Inside Out, came out maybe four or five years ago and it's great. I really recommend it. It's on Nat Geo. And a lot of the episodes of that series really touched on some of the questions that we were also asking in this film. And so as we were um, beginning the project and we had kind of like a rough work sample, um, my dad shared it with her and just said, I think you would really care about this story um, that they're telling. And so we shared her an early cut and she said, I'm in much to our delight. So um, it's been such a treat to have her on our team and um, just wind in our sails, you know, this is um, both of our first time directing, my first time in the film industry, and so to have her confidence and um, willingness to be part of our team has been um, a real dream for both of us, and Aaron grew up being a super fan of Katie, so <laughs> um, yeah, it's been great. Well, listen, Chris, uh, it, it's great that the two of you were willing to share your story, and I'm sure that it's been a, a very rewarding experience, but it's always nerve wracking for anyone to be in a documentary. And I was wondering if you ever had any real fears in terms of any ramifications that might come out of being involved in a project like that, like this, uh, considering the nature of the story. Uh, yeah, I mean, initially, of course, I mean, you're coming out in a very public way about some things that you probably don't want everybody to know about. Um, but I mean, like, I, I was really surprised at the amount of, you know, like, people that were just, they were okay with it. They actually, they were encouraging it. Um, and it was through like the initial response that like, I found, you know, the the fact that like I had to talk about this I had to open up about it and I had to, to share this story because I'm not the only one like me in this country so you know it, it put me on a path to where I can I can start to heal myself and you know work towards helping other people now so has anything negative come out of the experience so far I mean I get the random like you know, Facebook warrior that wants to jump on a, a post and, and say something awful. But, uh, you know, for every one of those, there's 500 others that are supportive, uplifting and encouraging. So, I mean, you know, I have fans. <laughs> <laughs> and how does that feel? <laughs> I mean, like if they're talking about me, they're leaving somebody else alone. And, uh, you know, uh, I, I love everybody that, that have met to this point that supported me and, and I love the ones that don't. So, 
Uh, I love everybody. <laughs> uh, Dr. and Arlo, uh, tell me a little bit about both of your motivations for getting involved in this movie. I, oh, I do yeah. a ton of Q&A response. I'd love to hear what Aval says first, but um, and, and actually it's Arno. Uh, I, I can't sing, so the, the Arlo. Um, <laughs> I, I try though, and, and I, uh, Arlo Guthrie is awesome. But um, yeah, my motivation was really to uh, help bring Chris's story to the world and, and Melissa's story. I, to me, M Melissa is really like the big hero of this film uh, and, and definitely a, a catalyst uh, more so than, than anyone else, I think. Um, but really, I, my uh, kind of intention when I create content is that I want people from extreme ends of the political spectrum on either end to walk away from it after experiencing it and going, that was awesome. Like that was really meaningful. Uh, and and uh, Din and Aaron have done such an amazing job with Refuge. I, I think it really uh, ticks those boxes and accomplishes that. So um, I'm just honored to be a part of it. And uh, we'd love to hear what what uh, Val has to say. And since meeting of all too, I I've, I've really wanted to uh, do anything I could to help up his platform. Um, he's he's a pretty busy guy, but uh, he's got a, such a great story, and and he's such a, a amazing human being that uh, to see him shine his light on the world through this film is is really important to me. Oh, thank you, Arno. We should record that and send it to my wife. <laughs> so, so she could recognize my value. And, you know, I don't have as many fans as I don't have as many fans as Chris does, but uh, Chris's back, I love Chris's background. The fan is really making me feel cold. I've been texting him <laughs> for the last couple of hours about it. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's been a great experience. That's how we interact. You know, we joke a lot and um, you know, the one thing I did that documentary to purposely show people, you don't have to have an academic, what a scientific agenda to change people. You know, the way I talk to Chris is the way I talk to my friends here in Clarkston and my area or people I used to meet along my life. Like, so I think people, uh, you know, try to always very hard to pursue people to change with a certain agenda. And I think that could backfire and comes out unreal. Uh, and I think the, you know, the purpose of the documentary showed there's really two human beings that look so different, but also very similar, you know? You know, if you put Chris and I next to each other and also Arnold, we all came from a background of struggling and suffering. We all had some kind of trauma in our life. Some of us, you know, went some wrong direction, eventually came to the right direction. You know, people like me get a lot of credit from coming from zero to a hundred, you know, I came here as a refugee. Now I'm a doctor. It's considered the American dream, but nobody looks at Chris who went to negative 100. He's back to 10, you know, his progress, it was much more effective than mine in a scientific measure. So, um, and that's my goal is to showcase that one is very natural to change people by actually approaching it like a natural method, you know, and, uh, and just, you know, treat each other like the way you want to be treated or to treat your fellow neighbors one of the messages that's so powerful in the film is and maybe several of you can address this is that i think a lot of people here are loud and clear that all different groups need to be treated with respect um, but doctor when you when you emphasize that we need to pay attention to the people in the middle of the country you know between new york and california um, it's really important um, when did you realize that that was such a, a vital part of the message of this film? You know, honestly, it became very visible during the Trump election where, you know, you know, I'm, I consider myself a moderate, you know, you know, I, you know, my dad voted for John McCain. I voted for, you know, Obama. My, my father loved George Bush. You know, I like, you know, democratic. I mean, just what I'm saying is like, when I start noticing that the, the left 
start thinking they know better than the rights because they went to school or they had some kind of degree next to the name. And that was wrong. I'm a physician, you know, when patients walk in my room, I don't start my conversation. I know better than you. I'm the doctor. Just be quiet. I know what to do for you. That's not how I approach anyone. Like, you know, you have to listen to people. You have to figure out where their issues are coming from. And technically, they say in medicine, if you 90% of the time, if you listen to the patient, they give you the diagnosis and how to fix the problem. So that's something we lost in our political environment. Nobody wanted to listen. Everyone wanted to be right. And then eventually backfired in certain state, you know, and, and the way, you know, if you, you're from the right, you thought you won, you're from the left, you thought you lost. So it's kind of like, but never, so they, we never came to a common ground, you know, and that's the issue. Like, and I love this country so much that I don't want it to lose that foundation that made me who I am today. And that's why I reached out to Chris. I mean, I just wanted to show the people, if a physician who is fresh graduate living in Atlanta could reach out to some veteran, former drug, you know, addict, former KKK member, in two hours away, you could reach out to that person and have a normal conversation and treat him like a friend. If I could do it, you should be able to do it. You, you know, if you think you're too smart, let's talk about how intelligent you are. If you think, you know, like, that's what really upset me, though, when people start thinking that the, a degree next to the name or some wealth made him better than someone who lived in rural America or middle America. That's something upset me because I'll, I just feel like that's not the right way we should approach people. And I feel like I had to be the advocate for people like Chris. Ben and Aaron, um, you must have known you had a great idea from the beginning, but it's hard to make a documentary. And one of the tough things is knowing what stuff to film. So how did you go about creating the structure of this movie and figuring out what are the moments that you need to show in order to tell this story? Because it's an unusual story. Ooh, documentaries are indeed hard to make. <laughs> um, the the post-production process for this film was a bear because the vision that Aaron set out to capture initially and, and so much of the footage that we captured um, and the story that we thought we were telling really shifted when Chris was introduced to Haval and became part of the film. And so there was a long time that we were editing where we had kind of two movies jumbled into one and it took us a long time to figure out, is it a film about Chris and Haval? Is it a film about Chris? Is it Clarkson? You know, what is it? And I think as soon as we landed on the title Refuge, it became really clear to us how this is one story. It's a story of people in pursuit of belonging and security and identity. And we see the ways that when we seek those things in dangerous places, the harm that can be caused, but we also see the fruit and the beauty when we seek and we provide refuge for one another and when we are a refuge for one another. So I think that helped us kind of tie it together, but we have thousands of hours of footage that unfortunately wasn't able to make it into our documentary, um, even characters who we filmed with who are no longer part of the story. So, um, I mean, it was tough. It felt like Sophie's choice over and over and over again. How, what would you say, Erin? <laughs> yeah, a hundred percent to all of that. Um, and I just have to acknowledge that Ahmed is now here. <laughs> <laughs> I saw hey, you waving, buddy. I figured he might've been. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Is it hi? I'm big. Hi. 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 <laughs> so hi, Ahmed. Um, Ahmed is one of I think ten babies that were born to our cast and crew during right. the making of this movie. <laughs> Chris, Chris, and Melissa's kids were already born. <laughs> 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 he's, try he's trying to say that right now. Um, Although the story. Uh, shows the positive movement uh, and changes uh, of Chris. Um, there is that very disturbing KKK footage. Can you talk a little bit about um, where you got that footage? And also, Chris, if you can maybe tell us a little bit more of what we were seeing, what was going on there, and then we actually seen the movie, just some background. Yeah, I'll let Chris chime in. But first, we did not capture that footage. We licensed that footage. Um, 
it was scary enough to go meet Chris the first time. Um, <laughs> sorry, Chris, but it, um, yeah, we didn't capture that. Um, so I'll let him add some more. I mean, I'm not hundred percent sure as to like what kind of question you're asking. Tell you more about elaborate a little bit. Yeah, what were we looking at there? Like, was that a, a oh. normal, you know? Yeah, so that's uh, that's your typical uh, KKK clan rally that, that you're witnessing there. We had new people showing up that we were hazing and antagonizing and, you know, mingling with. And then later on that night, we had we had the ceremony, so. Have you heard from, from any of the, the people that you used to be involved with since this movie has come out? Interestingly, I have. Um, I've met, I, I mean, I've run into a few people. Um, so like there was uh, one of our Imperial wizards at the time that uh, I've talked to since uh, all of this has went down, who's like, who's actually left as well. He's, he's doing well. He's doing good. He's just working and with his family. So that was a positive. And, you know, I, I've not really run into anybody from my old set yet, but I run into enough younger versions of me every single day that uh, I'm definitely getting my feel worth of, of, of me. So, uh, you know, working, working with these kids that are, that we're trying to help leave this, uh, these hate groups at parents for peace is, uh, it's a it's a twenty four seven job, man. Um, you know, so uh, we're just we're seeing a lot of a lot of really needy people that need help. So before we get more into parents for peace, which which we definitely want y'all to talk about, Den, will you share what you share a lot of times about like showing the cross burning and kind of yeah, yeah. The um one of the things that really um was significant for us when we were making this was for most Americans, when we see imagery of a burning cross in the radicalized version of it, like a KKK rally, we can pretty quickly and easily disassociate that from the actual Christian faith. Like to us, we're like, I'm not afraid to go into a church because I've seen this image of a burning cross in the context of a KKK rally. But the the Muslim faith is generally not given that advantage and that um, consideration. I think, you know, the kind of collective trauma that we've experienced from 9-11, I think many Americans are quick to associate um, jihadism and extremism with all of Islam. And so um, I think our hope with part of this film too is to help separate that a little bit for people and also like help us think about because we are kind of a Western country and the Christian faith is something more of us are a little more familiar with. Um, the, I don't know, that really struck us. And, and we put it next to a scene in which, um, oh, I guess we didn't end up doing that, did we, with Humboldt's mom praying. Anyway, that was just the thing that was important to us. <laughs> Chris, can I ask you, you know, you mentioned that you have fans now, and I think you come across, you know, very decently in the movie, and I can understand why you're able to um, get a lot of fans today. Um, is there anything that you can tell us about some of the people that you used to associate with, uh, who we don't know so well, that maybe we just don't understand, you know, part of their story in general, or should we fear them? So uh, I can only speak for me, um, but I experienced in my journey what so many people do. Uh, I had a very traumatizing childhood, and I've been through what we call compound trauma, which is more than one events, and usually it's some physical events as well as some emotional events. Um, that's the case for a lot of the people that I was involved with. Um, a lot of them, you know leave the movement but go into what we call a political extremism because it's so acceptable in today's culture to bash the right or bash the left which is kind of like why i don't get involved in politics because in my opinion they're both stupid if they won't come to the table uh so i mean i i just i would i would implore you to be kind 
And I know that's a big stretch because they're the, they're the, the terrorists. They're the, they're the people that are, you know, being such negative individuals, but sometimes the most broken people will scream out for help in the most destructive ways. And those destructive ways are just their way of communicating. So as soon as I was able to realize that my negative reaction wasn't getting a, a response from Arno or from Haval or even from my wife anymore, it, it lost its effect, man. And just the dialogue, you know, rather than say you're the bad guy, you know, ask why they're hurting, why they're suffering. And I'm, I promise you, they'll tell you. Anyone here can answer this, but uh, I'm sorry, you, you want to add something to that first? Yeah, I was just going to say one thing that um, became really clear to us and, and, spending so much time with Chris and Arno is, and Arno, you have articulated this really well, um, that all versions of extremism are some narrative of victimhood, you know? Like, I think you literally said, Arno, you switched the us's and the them, but the narrative is the same. And so when you think about a person who is susceptible to that narrative, it's somebody who's not in a good place and somebody that is maybe lacking community, lacking purpose, lacking identity, and looking for somebody outside of themselves to blame for their circumstances. And so I think, I feel like we just got a, a more full understanding of that in through Haval, uh, excuse me, Arno and Chris. Arno, I feel like you should add on to this because we have so many nuggets of gold from you that we couldn't <laughs> include in the film. <laughs> Um, so I've been working in the counter-violent extremism space uh, internationally for 12 years now. In that space, I'm what's known as a former, as in a former violent extremist. Uh, Chris is a former as well. And then um, also in that space, you find survivors who are survivors of violent extremism. I, I think uh, Haval and his family are, are certain survivors. But it, it's not a binary. Um, I've never met a former who's not also a survivor. Uh, Chris is a survivor of PTSD from deployment with the US military. He's a survivor from methamphetamine addiction. He's a survivor from all sorts of horrific abuse that he faced as a child. And today, I, Chris and I count amongst our, our dear friends and colleagues Formers of every stripe, you can imagine. Uh, we both got a, a buddy named Mubin Sheikh, who's a, a colleague of ours in, in Parents for Peace. And Mubin is a former jihadi. And uh, I have one of my best friends is a guy in Denmark who's a former Antifa. Uh, I know former members of ISIS, former members of Al Qaeda, former uh, militants who are Israeli or Palestinian. And Every single violent extremist I've ever met has that same story that Din's talking about, where they, they have that basic human need for identity, purpose, and belonging, but they weren't able to find healthy answers to those needs, as most people fortunately do. And so when you, when you don't answer those needs in a healthy way, there's all sorts of unhealthy ways just kind of lurking and waiting to swoop in, whether it's just plain old substance abuse, or an eating disorder or cuttings because some kind of self-harm or it's it's a violent extremist ideology be it white nationalism or religious extremism political extremism and and as Din mentioned when you really like distill all these different flavors of violent extremism you find the exact same story every single time you have different us's and them's but otherwise it's basically like our in-group good guys are being oppressed by the evil out-group bad guys and we need to fight back with everything we have and, and nothing's off the table and that's what we're going to do because um, otherwise we're going to be extinct. Otherwise we're going to be destroyed. And uh, that, that's the narrative of the Ku Klux Klan. That's the narrative of the so-called Islamic State. That's the narrative of Antifa. Uh, it's the exact same story, just the different us versus them. And, and really at the root of it all is trauma. It's, it's, it's most simply summed up as, as hurt people hurt people. I was wondering with everything that's going on now with the war in Ukraine, you know, what, what struck me is how 
significant 9-11 was uh, in both of course your story and also in the doctor's story and, 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 and how you know, people suffered for many years after 9-11 from discrimination and, and also a lot of people who fought in that war were hurt very badly. Um, now you're hearing so many stories about um, people being discriminated against for being Russian. I right? just never expected I'd see that in our lifetime. Um, are you guys concerned about the war uh, and, and how it might encourage uh, some of the things that you're exploring this, in this film? Yeah. Uh, no, go ahead. Or yeah, Chris, you go, you go. Yeah, no, go ahead. I didn't have a fully baked thought. I was actually passing it to you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I think anytime there's a, a socioeconomic situation that can be politicized, you're going to find people attacking somebody else based on the narrative that's provided, right? You see people attacking people in the streets based on which news channel they watch, Fox or CNN. Uh, you know, you've seen the Asian, uh, the Asians attacked because of the COVID. You see Russians being attacked that don't support the war in Ukraine now. And, and I think it's all based on just a lack of information and, and a lack of understanding about the magnitude of the situation. Um, I mean, unfortunately, we are, we're seeing the rises in it. And it is concerning. Anytime somebody is uh, attacked or, or targeted just because of their racial, sexual, religious orientation and connection to something else, is, it's just unacceptable. And, you know, I, I, I hope that people will take the time to realize that every Russian isn't involved for the war in Ukraine. I mean, that should speak for itself, but... You know, I, I pray for, for everybody involved, both Russians and the Ukrainians. Um, you know, and, I, I'd and add to, Oh, sorry, go ahead, Arno. Sorry, I, I would add to that that uh, next to the Ukrainians, the people suffering most because of this war are, are the Russian people. And, and my heart just absolutely breaks for thinking of all, you know, if you had a business in Russia, Russia, you're, you're done. Your business, everything you worked for your entire life is now just up in smoke. And uh, so it, it's a really tragic thing. And, and again, like Chris said, compassion's the answer here. We, we need to bear witness to all the suffering that's happening, um, no matter where it's happening and no matter who's suffering, we need to bear witness to all of it. And that's well, sort that's of that's what that's I was, that. Um, was going to is I feel you know obviously terrible for what's happening in Ukraine but anytime someone asks me about it I ask them like have you thought about why the news hasn't been covering the the war and genocides happening in Congo or Ethiopia or Yemen um, so I think that's a big thing that we learned in Clarkston um, is that this is happening all over the world. And, and I think, you know, I, I, I love like driving down the street and seeing the Ukrainian flags. And I love that Ireland, instead of like wearing green on Thursday, they're going to wear yellow and blue. And I love that my husband joined Tinder in Ukraine so that he can give money to people, you know, like there's all this incredible stuff happening in this outpouring of love. But as someone who's spent so much time in Clarkston and like other parts of the developing world, it, it just like further breaks my heart that nobody's talking about or knows about these wars that have been going on for 30 and 40 years. Really yeah, I feel like it, um, it that really illuminates um, to what extent I think this is, it's, this is resonating because it's a horrible atrocity that's happening, of course, but I do think there's a sense of like their cities look like ours, you know, and for those of us who are white, the people that we're seeing being displaced and killed and terrified and fighting for their country look like we do. And so I think it um, does strike a different chord. And I think it is worth us all kind of considering why that is, you know, um, and offering the same kind of compassion and outrage for 
the immense suffering that happens everywhere to cities that don't look like ours, to countries that don't look like ours and to people that don't look like we do, you know? Um, but I think we hope that, you know, it's been interesting throughout making this film, the relevance and urgency of it has evolved day to day, it seems, you know, one, one crisis after the next makes us feel like, oh, man, unfortunately for the world, our film has something to say about this. In, you know, for a few years, it was the dismantling of the American Refugee Resettlement Program, it's polarization, it's September 6th, you know, it kind of keeps evolving. But I do hope that our film can speak into, you know, we're seeing what happens when authoritarian leadership um, is unchecked, you know, and the horrors of war and the horrors of a mass group of people being killed and displaced. And so I hope our film can offer a little bit of hope and a little bit of um, healing to our world who continues to need that hope and healing, you know? Melissa, um, we probably wouldn't all be speaking here tonight if it wasn't for you. Um, yeah. Well, I was wondering, you know, um, you know, everyone's talking about suffering, but, but you suffered for a number of years. And I was wondering if you ever imagined that, that uh, the two of you would be featured in a film and how does it feel to know that your story, uh, all of your stories are making such a big difference now to so many people? I never thought for one minute, I think we're muted. No, we're, we're good, I, I got you. I never thought for one minute that like, anything would happen or anything would change you know I was just like you can't you pretty much you can't win the lottery without playing so I was like you know let's just shoot a shot in the dark you know here and let's see what happens and never in a million years did I think that you know I would receive or there would be somebody out there that had been through the same thing that he was going through and would be willing to help and the moment that I met, well, Arno met Chris, I was like, in the back of my mind, I'm sitting here thinking, you know, this is not going to go anywhere. Like it's, 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 a, it's, it's a stop. I mean, I'm just waiting for Arno to just walk away and say, you know what, I can deal with it. I can't. And, you know, I had already mentally prepared in my mind that I'm going to have to walk away. And never in my life did I want my kids to bro to grow up in a broken family and I was like you know I have to do what I have to do as a mom to keep my family together I have to do what I can as a wife to do what I said in my vows through sickness and health and I knew that this was not him he was he was sick and a lot of people say well you can't use that as a crutch you know I knew the person that I met and that was not him. And I knew that at this point in time, he did not love himself. And like he was, he was battling in himself. And I knew that I had to be the one to show him the love that he needed to show him the love that what he could see. And I didn't think that, you know, it would go this far. Like, and like, I try to hide as much as possible because like everybody says oh well you're the and I'm just like no I I just I was a wife I was a mom and never did I think being a like being a wife and a mom doing what you're supposed to would be like huh but it is and like I just I, you know a lot of people like I said that uh whenever we was in Colorado before we went there was a, a young a young kid on our ball team and you know I, he was he was like, you know, I don't believe you. You're not in a movie. That's why, da, 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 da. So I showed him the preview and he immediately says, well, my mom would have just left. And I was like, oh, okay. And he goes, but you did the right thing. You kept your family together. And now CJ has his mom and now CJ has his dad and, and, CJ doesn't believe that that was him in that film. Like, he's always like, that's not me. You guys just got some random kid. And I was like, okay, bud, you go, go for it. Right. But he's not. So I'm okay with that. I'm just, 
like like you said at the beginning you know do you worry about anything that's i'm afraid that one day somebody is going to see this film and it rubs them the wrong way because there is a lot of people that says you know you stayed you put up with it and i did i did stay and i did put up with it but that doesn't make me wrong for doing that because i didn't believe in the same thing he did i just knew that i had to be that person for whenever he fell i was right there to catch him and to hold him back up and there was lots of times where i felt like i was going to get pushed down and he was going to overpower me but i was like you know i might be smaller than him and he might be a lot stronger but moms have a lot of will behind them and i was pushing and i kept him well i think the audience has some questions but if i can ask one more question uh Chris and Doctor, uh, I think people are just really intrigued by your relationship. I don't know how much of it was just for the movie or, or how close the two of you have grown, but I was wondering if you can just share with the audience what it is that both of you like about each other that we didn't already hear in the movie. Oh man, that's a loaded question, dude. We <laughs> have a lot of time, man. Like, I just. I'm just going to be real about it. You know, he's, we're the same age. We like the, the same stuff and we, uh, we have the same kind of, of humor off camera. You know, I mean, it's just, he's a genuine person. And, uh, you know, I, I, I value the quality of my life with him in it. And I couldn't, I, I couldn't imagine my life without him all in it and his family. So, you know, I mean, why does there have to be things we like and dislike about each other? You know, I mean, <laughs> we like the same stuff, man. We like food. We like kids. We like helping people, and uh, we we like each other. That's that's the most important part for me. Oh uh, yeah, that's a good. You know, honestly, I never thought about that question because it's just natural. I mean, you know, like it's like when you ask me, "What do you like about my best friend Ali of twenty years?" I never sat down and looked in the mirror and thought about Chris and say. What do I enjoy? It's just a natural, you know, I guess, uh, friendship. You know? And that's what I think I tell people. It just, you know, clicks, you know, if you just treat you know, Chris is just a good human being. And let's not forget, you know, he's a veteran. You know, he went to war and, you know, to protect our country, regardless if you agree with what war it was. But it's someone to, you know, to say, I'm going to go leave my family and defend our country that's something very honorable and respectable so and i think that's one of the things i really appreciate him for well thank you everybody so much and, uh, it's some questions. so if anyone does please uh, raise your hand so we can say I'm wondering how uh, CJ uh, oh, how have you worked with him to acknowledge the journey that Chris has, has, has gone through? Uh, I'm sure Chris and Melissa, um, th there were a lot of things for, for CJ to, to unlearn and to learn uh, a, a different way of interacting. <laughs> With, with the people that he meets in, in his community and in his world. So I'm wondering, I, I, we talked a lot about the macro, um, but I'm just wondering what kind of work your family had to do um, between you and your kids. Um, so that's a really good question. Myra was so small. Uh, she doesn't even remember it. Like, I mean, she remembers the latter part of, when we started our documentary, like the last part of it, she doesn't remember the early stages. Um, CJ was just, he was in that really amazing stage of, I'm not paying attention to anything that's going on around me. I'm just replicating what you're doing because I look up to you. So the really beautiful thing about getting out when I did was I had just started to get my son involved in it. So the footage that you see of him with his little robe, that was that was the very first one that I had taken him to and one of the very first times I had him around the, the group. Um, so this was like, 
you know, he, he, he forgot everything very fast. Um, we immediately transitioned from the hateful rhetoric uh, to, you know, corrective exposure things. And, and to be honest with you, like, I mean, it sounds like a very vague answer, but it was a very vague process. I just led by example. He followed my lead and, you know, we're lucky that he doesn't, he doesn't really believe it would ever, it had ever happened, you know? I remember being on a shoot, I guess it was probably like May or June of 2019. Cause I was like eight months pregnant and it was so hot. And I remember being at y'all's house and Chris, I think you were at work. And so we were just like filming Verite stuff with Melissa and Melissa, you were like doing dishes and telling me um, how CJ um, had made a friend that summer, like a, he had made an, a friend from India, a friend from Mexico, and that that like helped you and me realize like, okay, he's going to be okay, yeah. you know? Uh, I, the little boy that, I can't remember what his name was, but um he would the little boy didn't speak any English he was from India and like his, his Ganesh. Parents, yes Ganesh um his parents would move a lot because of where his dad worked and CJ actually took the steps of you know Ganesh would teach him a word in, in Indian and then CJ would teach him a word in English and he would just come home and he was like so I taught Ganesh this this today and you know, and I'm just like, okay. And then now Myra, Myra, she's like, uh, whenever Arno comes, we get to learn a new word in Spanish. So <laughs> Myra is fully intrigued with like the, the Spanish language. Like she wants to know. Dude, it's like, I language. got a little Dora running around my house. Like she literally like the haircut, everything. She runs around, she comes in, she's like, hola. And I'm like, no, <laughs> like, I, stop right there. Go deal with your mother. <laughs> she'll say well arno will teach me that's right arno knows spanish daddy doesn't so <laughs> daddy knows cuss words you don't want to learn those go <laughs> doctors does he have any interest or has he gone back to what might have been kurdistan to talk about this or to see what's going on in that part of the world and perhaps bring some of this message back to that part of the world Haval, did you hear him? Yes, yes, now okay. I hear. Uh, thank you. Uh, that's a great question. You know, uh, a, a lot of immigrants, a lot of refugees, when they come to this, you know, a lot of the foreign country, the first thing comes to their mind is like, how do I help back home? And the best thing ever happened to me first is, how do I build a strong foundation in my new home first before I'm an effective help to anywhere back home? You know, the Kurdish cause is a, is a very complicated historical issue in, you know, in, in the Middle East. Uh, and my main focus is to build as a strong foundation in the U.S. by being a fellow American and, and at the same time educating as many Americans about the Kurdish cause for them to become advocate for my people. I think that's the best way to approach it because it's honestly not fair to America after America gave me 20 years of it's land and time to make me achieve where I am and to say, hey, see you guys, I'm gonna go back and fix some problem in my, my country that I never really lived for a long time. It's just not, a, it's not part of being Kurdish. So, you know, they say, whoever taught you a, an alphabet, you own them a book, you know, and I own America volumes before even I could help anyone else. But a great question. Haval, Haval do you wanna talk about the Kurdish American medical mentoring you do and and like the mentoring you do for all kinds of people yeah i mean we you know through my training i noticed there's lack of you know medical doctors from poor background and you know underserved backgrounds you could look at it from racial and you know socioeconomic and rural and i started during the process of building formal programs to help kids from that from high school and college level from those areas to become uh, doctors and you know we you know I, I remember I started in my fellowship at one high school now we had like 14 locations serving 500 students uh, hosting various activities that's something I started and you know train people to take over and kind of I'm, I'm leading from distance now at the same time just to focus on my Kurdish 
heritage, I actually focus on advancing the Kurds in America. So we have a, a medical organization where we help Kurdish students become doctors. So overall leading back to, you know, building a strong foundation in the U.S. So this is one of my advocacy work right now is changing the face of medicine. Uh, I don't know if you guys know, only less than 5% of doctors are African-American or Hispanic um, and less than uh, 7% are from a uh, poor background and I think less than 3% are from rural America. So there's obviously a big disparity in the healthcare field and, uh, and it drives a lot of the outcomes that we see, so. Chris Mara, uh, can you uh, get a sense of what percentage of uh, individuals who have the uh, um, extremist uh, white supremacy here in our country are amenable to the changes that uh, you guys have worked so hard to accomplish? So how, how frequent do you think uh, if they make themselves available to your work? Would you be successful at getting to change? It, that's that's basically like asking what percentage of alcoholics are amenable to quitting drinking. I mean, it's it's basically it, it's a it's a public health issue, and and instead of being addicted to alcohol or cocaine or methamphetamine, people are addicted to hate and and to violent extremist ideology. So anyone who's an addict is going to hit rock bottom at some point during their addiction journey. And it's just a, a matter of when that rock bottom happens, are, are they going to uh, know that it's possible to ask for help? Um, we, we've done a great job as a society for substance abuse to, you know, anybody who, who's an addict or even a user knows, well, if I, if I need to quit drinking, I go to AA. If I need to quit uh, methamphetamine, I go to NA. Um, I, I think right now we're just in a position where we really need to raise awareness that, first of all, violent extremism is a public health issue. It's not a political issue. And that when people need help to change their lives and, and to kick their addiction to hate, that there are places to go. Uh, Chris and I both work with a group, uh, it, Haval's done uh, work with Parents for Peace as well. Uh, we work with a group called Parents for Peace. You saw it on the, the card at the end of the film. People can learn more about Parents for Peace at parentsforpeace.org with the number four. Uh, at our website, we have a toll-free helpline that's available nationwide, either loved ones of uh, someone who's getting involved in violent extremism, or uh, individuals themselves can call and ask for help. I'm on the advisory board for Parents for Peace. Uh, I'm, I'm kind of the same relationship uh, Haval now has with his nonprofit, but Chris is on the front lines. Uh, Chris, on a full-time basis, is working with people to uh, disengage them. He's a specialist for white nationalists, but uh, I know that like Chris and Mubin, um, will like kind of cross consult so that if Mubin's working with a kid who's getting mixed up in some jihadi group, uh, a lot of times they'll bring Chris in to uh, give another perspective. And that's a really powerful thing. I, I actually, uh, it, to, to have that capacity to work across the, the various factions of violent extremism. So um, if, if people are interested in, in helping uh parents for peace scale uh we we always are in need of financial support that's that's how chris gets paid so uh if you go to the website parentsforpeace.org and and you're uh interested and in, and in, in a position to make a donation that that's a huge help okay so arno din aaron chris melissa doctor thank you so much uh this film is amazing and Thank you. Thank you all for having us. Good to see all of you.